All right. It is the week of March 7th, 2022, and this is the Fight Business Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Auger, and today we're going to talk about Eagle FC. They have signed a multi-million dollar deal, sponsorship deal, which will be a big, big move for them. We'll break down what that is, as well as signed a lot of notable names and familiar faces from the UFC, Bellator, a couple of big vet names. So we're going to talk about their strategy, why they're doing that, as well as the sponsorship and what we can expect as they continue to try and make a name for themselves stateside at the U.S. Uh, then we're going to talk about Jorge Masvidal's new contract. Apparently, he's a top three, top five paid fighter in the UFC, according to his agent. We'll break down how much truth there probably is to that, as well as why he re-upped right before UFC 272. Then we're going to discuss... Uh, new UFC signage. If you missed UFC 272, got a brand new LED lighting screen that shows all of the sponsors. We'll talk about why that's important for the UFC and how it falls in line with what we've been talking about with sponsorship revenue being their new big target as they continue to grow. Then we've got to talk about PFL super fights. So Kayla Harrison did resign with the PFL to a multi-year contract. We kind of knew that was coming, but more important than that, apparently there's going to be the super fights on pay-per-view According to the PFL, we're going to discuss the feasibility of that, what the buys might look like, uh, who, you know, Harrison, as well as others could fight on this super fight league type thing. We'll break all of that down. And then last but not least, we need to talk about Endeavor getting sued. So a consultant has sued Endeavor, uh, allegedly saying that their marketing strategy and the way that they were communicating Endeavor's IPO to investors was stolen by Endeavor. Uh, no credit, no compensation, anything like that. We'll break down that lawsuit from a high level as well as, you know, why someone might do this, company or the consultant suing. Got timestamps in the bottom as always. Do want to mention, if you are a podcast listener, this will now be on the Sure Dogs podcast um, website. So you need to search for Sure Dog Podcast and this is where you will find it. It won't be on the same channels it was before. I'm working on kind of uploading some of the backfill of that, but moving forward, expect this to be on the Sure Dog Podcast Network in case there's any confusion there. I got a couple of questions. So just a heads up on that. Timestamps in the bottom as always if you're on YouTube and let's go ahead and dive right in. All right. So first thing we're going to dive into today is Eagle FC has announced an official multi-year partnership with Cy. Saitama, I believe I'm saying that right, um, which is a crypto community. It, it's Inu at Inu Saitama, which is also known in the crypto community as Saitama. It is a lead leading community driven crypto platform promoting financial well being. That's Eagle FC's official tweet on the matter. And if you go to their website, uh, you know they they talk about fostering the future of finance. Um, their mission. Statement is to educate the next generation investors and make financial well-being accessible to all. Uh, they have transparency. They have a road roadmap, white paper. Big deal. Multi-million dollar deal for Eagle FC. Um, it's no crypto.com, right? But it is a, a huge amount of revenue for the promotion. And as Eagle FC looks to expand stateside, uh, that revenue is going to be put in a lot of different places. Um Fighter signings, which we'll talk about here in a second, is a big area. But, um, you know, it'll help with production costs, travel and logistics, since a lot of, you know, uh, Eagle FC's production members and, you know, people running the company like Habib and his uh, his his right-hand man, um, name is escaping me. But, but a lot, basically, a lot of people doing production live in Dagestan, right? Um, so th they've been trying to make landfall in the U S here for a while. You've got this weekend coming up, uh, Kevin Lee versus Diego Sanchez headlining that card. A couple other notable vets on there as well. Um, UFC vets, which again, we'll talk about here in a second, but this partnership is important for a lot of reasons. One, it again shows that crypto is tied a lot to the MMA fan base. And that's not surprising. If you go on any forum, sure dog, uh, MMA, Twitter, what have you, 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 you have a lot of talk in, in certain corners uh, about crypto. And I've personally know a lot of people who are into MMA that are also into crypto. You have Ben Askren, a lot of UFC fighters um, or UFC vets or notable fighters. Um, Chris Cyborg talking about crypto, pushing crypto. 
seems to have a, a big overlap in your target audience. So not shocked that a cryptocurrency would get involved, but a very big step for Eagle FC because it is their first big sponsorship and shows, again, the drawing power of Habib as well as some of the names they're bringing on, right? I mean, multi-million dollars for what is considered a, right now, a regional promotion is a very big deal. And Habib has talked about his aspirations to grow this out larger and become more of a true competitor in some ways uh, to the UFC and others. That is the first step. I mean, multi-million dollar sponsorship is the first step. So very big deal. Um, their first real big sponsorship signing that we've heard of and something that will help them reach their strategic goals long term. So big deal there. Let's talk about the fighter signings because that's probably where a fair amount of that money will go. Um, if you miss the news, Eagle FC has signed Thiago Silva, Hector Lombard, and JDS to fight in the promotion. If you look at the long-term strategy here, right, you've got to look at another promotion that did this similar type of signing spree, which was Bellator, not that long ago. Uh, what, three, four years ago even? They were still hiring a lot of UFC vets, UFC names. Let's take a step back and explain why Eagle FC is trying to do this. They're obviously trying to grow, but a big part of that is, again, just getting their brand name out there, getting viewers and eyeballs on their product. We've talked before on this program about competitive advantage. And if, if you are unfamiliar with that episode, go back and look up that episode. It's one of my favorite episodes I've ever done. Breaks down you know, how you get a competitive advantage in business, what that looks like, et cetera. But if, if you take that same model we've talked about, right, and you look at the asymmetry, which is having more than your competitors, and then the scarcity, which is having a resource that is not easily accessible to competitors, and you have that combination, that goes a long way in terms of helping you gain market share. And the interesting thing is, is that while we talk about, and we've talked about before, uh, the asymmetry and, and scarcity that the UFC had, with their fighters having the best in the world. That's how they kind of, you know, locked the best fighters in the world into these long-term contracts. And that's what bolstered their competitive advantage and allowed it to continue to just grow and grow and grow. We also have to talk about perceived scarcity because here's the truth about a lot of these guys. They have name value, but we know if you're a hardcore MMA fan, right? You know that JDS isn't what he used to be right? He's not the guy that went in there and took the belt from Kane or had the wars with Kane Velasquez, um, or even made a second run and had, you know, uh, the fight against Stipe the second time. He's not the same fighter that he was. He's older. He's, he's taken more damage is what it is. Kevin Lee, another notable name, younger and realistically has enough time to kind of turn things around, but not the same Kevin Lee we saw fight for the interim title against Tony Ferguson. But the interesting thing is, is that outside of hardcore MMA fans, once you start getting into the semi-casual or, you know, casual realm, that matters less once the name is established. And the scarcity becomes less about their actual skill and being this elite top five in the world and more about how many people remember who they are or know who they are fighting wise and are attached to them, right? It's in some ways similar to pro wrestling. Um, I mean, obviously the win and loss in pro wrestling is all prearranged and all that, but it's similar in that once you have a name value, people keep coming back and then that's where your true value is derived from is what you used to be not exactly what you are at this current state. It doesn't mean that your value is going to hold as you continue to lose and you take damage, right? Put on, if you have bad performances, et cetera, et cetera. But it creates its own scarcity for certain fans because there are fans that remember JDS, older fans who remember JDS that may have 
lapsed right out of uh, being a regular UFC watcher. Maybe they watch every once in a while when JDS is on, whatever, and then they hear or see, oh, JDS is is coming and fighting back, and and Hector Lombard, I remember him, and it's a nostalgia factor, right? That that's what it is. It's it's the Legends League quote-unquote, the Vitor Belter used to talk about. It's what Bellator did for a long time, continually signing either aged-out UFC vets or vets that really struggled and were cut from the UFC. Bellator would scoop them up. That was a lot of what it was. I mean, you had Frank Mir, you had Matt Mitrion, you had Roy Nelson, you had all these guys that used to be bigger names in the UFC now over at Bellator. Does it actually boost the ratings up that you would hope for? Well, I mean, for Bellator, probably not because you're already, you know, that number two promotion, you're trying to hit that next level. But especially for Eagle FC, who is brand new in the States and does not have a name for themselves, really, that's going to help you. That's going to help get hardcore eyes to watch your product and a lot of semi-casual hardcore eyes. Right, some lapsed fans or some fans that, yeah, maybe you check out a big pay per view or all the big pay per views and the occasional fight night card if it looks really good, but otherwise you don't really watch. You're not, you know, diehards like us watching every weekend, saying, "Oh yeah, I need to watch Bellator, UFC, PFL, uh, LFA, Invicta, all that stuff." Right? You get that next tier, and it kind of hits one of those tiers. And remember, we know that at least the UFC categorizes fans into eight different customer segments. I would imagine you're looking at hardcore, which is number eight, and then seven, maybe six, which is two steps beyond that. Some of six, mostly seven for this by using these, these older legends, but it works. It should bolster viewership and get people watching their inaugural show and maybe a show or two after. Now, will it sustain you for that long? That's harder to say. That Then it becomes a little bit different. But again, if you have those older names and new, brand, brand new, like Eagle FC, it makes sense to sign them just to get people to watch your product for the first time. We've seen diminishing returns on this through Bellator, through PFL. That's another great example, right? PFL has been around multiple seasons now and they signed some of their biggest names with Anthony Pettis, um, Fabricio Verdum, some of these bigger name, former UFC champs. And yet the ratings for PFL were not great. Right. And, and that goes to show again, that the names help a little bit, but once you are established, there's diminishing returns there. Because ultimately, the product is different. You're still looking for something exciting, something different. Usually, you have to be have at least one or two fighters that are perceived to be the best in order to keep the product moving. That's why PFL worked so hard to re-sign Kayla Harrison. Uh, that's why Bellator has kind of shifted and you know gone away from signing these older name UFC vets and focus more on their homegrown talent, which is really coming to its own, like AJ McKee, Adam Borix, uh, you know, those guys. It's, it's more about getting your brand off the ground when you're bringing in these names, but it won't last forever. You, just because you bring in a JDS, a Hector Lombard, a Thiago Silva, a Kevin Lee, uh, a Diego Sanchez, doesn't mean that if you continue to have fight cards on them for a you know a year or two that they're going to keep that same level of viewer interest because a lot of the hardcore fans and especially once you get beyond the hardcore fans the closer you get to the pure casual they want to see the best of the best that's how the UFC really you know just grasped a, a chokehold on the industry was by having the scarcity of true top elite fighters and locking them in, and then the asymmetry of they're the only brand that had you know so many top ranked guys in the world. Eagle FC is not going to be that. Bellator is trying to be that through their own homegrown talent, right? They're trying to essentially create those new guys that will be champions, be perceived as the best of the world and truly compete with the UFC. But 
when you're starting out and when nobody knows who you are, right? It makes sense to bring these guys in to bring in more hardcore and casual viewers for the first couple of times. It does. Habib's name will take Eagle FC much farther than it ever was as GFC, Gorilla FC or whatever. But having those bigger names on the cards, having them in exciting fights will help get the initial viewership there and, and just showcasing the product. Will it last long term? The, no, they'll have to pivot. But getting the first set of eyeballs on the product is, is step one. Right? If you're a startup, your first job is to get people to hear you out. That's that's step one. Even if they're like, nope, we hate you for whatever. It, first thing you got to do is get people to just listen. That's what this is. That's what these signings are. I imagine as they grow their roster, as they try and grow homegrown talent, they may eventually end up cutting some of these guys. I mean, some of these guys are older and they're going to retire soon anyway, right? So there's not a ton of risk in signing them now. But again, it is a it is a move to make a splash with the U.S. market and to get the initial eyes on the U.S. market. That's really step one. After that, got to find different ways to sustain them. So big moves by Eagle FC. Again, with everything going on um, in Ukraine and Russia, we won't touch on that. Too much this episode, but that multi million dollars certainly can't hurt um, Eagle FC, and, and that sponsorship will be a big deal for them in terms of signing these initial guys and and getting their foot off the of, you know feet off the ground in the U.S. So I think it's a good play by them. I think it makes sense long term, or sorry, short term. I think it makes sense strategically to do this. Long term, they still have to find another way to differentiate themselves and really capture that market get repeat customers but this is a great way to enter a market and that's really what this is about all right next up we're going to talk about Jorge Masvidal's new contract so obviously things didn't go Masvidal's way at UFC 272 but prior to that just days before uh, Masvidal did sign a new UFC contract that was extremely lucrative um Melky Kawa you know uh his agent and, you know, owner of first round management and all of that announced, you know, that he signed this new contract and stated, and this is this is from the ESPN article by Mark Ramonde, um, his contract pays him like a champion and then some. Uh, and the length of time will be that he will finish his UFC in the career. His career in the UFC. Hold on. And the length of time will be that he will finish his career in the UFC. Sorry been a day so you know it's one of those things where according to that sounds like he is you know getting paid very very well uh kawa said that you know it was signed after five months it makes him a top five fighter negotiations happened again with chief business officer hunter campbell who typically handles uh fighter negotiations so not shocked that that's really who he was dealing with but you know, if this is true, and Masvidal did say in the new contract, uh, my kids are going to be good for a long time, you know, all that stuff. If this is true, it is a, a, a big deal, right? Um, I, I think that we know in the past, we've we've heard fighters being signed as number one or number two. And we have the numbers from the UFC antitrust lawsuit that kind of dispute that, right? Um, we know that certain fighters were not the top tier paid fighters. We know that John Jones was not the top tier paid fighter, um, you know, back in 2015, all of that, that it, uh, wasn't, I don't believe it was even McGregor. I think at the time it was um, Lesnar. John Nash's article breaks it all down, but Again, we know that managers and agents will often come out and say, yeah, you know, we've killed it with this deal. We're now top five. We're, we're the highest paid fighter in this division, all this stuff. And ultimately, when we have the receipts of that, it turns out that that's not true at all. That, you know, they are paid well compared to other fighters, but they're not necessarily in the same ballpark. I think this new deal, based on what Kawa is saying here, um, 
I think this new deal, when it says the contract pays him like a champion and then some, he might be getting in the five or 600K range. Um, and then no pay-per-view points maybe, or maybe with pay-per-view points as well. That could easily be true. Um, I'd be shocked if they didn't include pay-per-view points like that, unless they opted for a non-pay-per-view point contract and just a high flat fee. We have seen that happen before. It's rare, but wouldn't be that shocking. Um, I think either way, it one speaks to the testament of Masvidal's drawing power, right? Because ultimately the only reason the UFC is going to offer him a deal like that is if the numbers back it up. And we know looking at the prelims for ESPN, as well as the social media metrics, I think I gave a buy rate of 400,000 last week or something like that. I now think I was horribly off in that regard, looking at all of the pre metrics we have now and all of that data guessing it's probably closer to six or 700,000 easy. Um, We'll see again, if we ever get numbers out, but probably closer to double than what I initially was, was throwing down. So that's all Masvidal, right? Covington is historically not a draw. Yes. He talks a lot. He, you know, gets a lot of attention from certain groups, but ultimately the numbers have never backed up Covington being a draw. And I don't think he's the draw here. He's definitely not the A side, even if he is enhancing things a little bit. And and it might be that the rivalry between Covington and Masvidal, the whole backstory, right, with them being friends and then now enemies, um, that did boost it quite a bit, similar to what um, John Jones in DC did for John Jones' strong power. Wouldn't be shocked to to see something of that nature, but ultimately, um, I feel like it's important. Important to note that Masvidal signing this contract a couple of days before has to be because the UFC sees his drawing power and has metrics to back that up. And I am sure that this contract is for, you know, six, eight fights, something like that. This isn't just a couple fights that he can then re- renegotiate at a later date. There is the new five year sunset clause. We know that is out there that, you know, in five years from March, what day is it? March 3rd or so. Uh, we know that in five years, so 2027, Masvidal would be a free agent based on that five-year sunset clause. But up until then, my guess is it's between a six and eight fight contract. And it's very much a, we're going to keep you here until you retire. Because Masvidal is older. He's, I think he's 37. Yeah, 37. Uh, I mean, he's probably going to fight out the rest of his career in the UFC unless he goes on a terrible losing streak uh, and then they decide to cut him. He's not drawing the numbers that he was. But I think he's probably reached that level where they'll keep him around as long as possible as long as he <clears throat> brings in the numbers, right? He could end up being a gatekeeper, uh, do the old Andre Orlovsky or what Overeem was doing for so long. Although Overeem was kind of in the mix. And I think Masvidal will stay in the mix for quite a bit, while, but... In a worst case scenario, Masvidal probably gets relegated to an Arlovsky gatekeeper type for new up and coming guys if he's continuing to fight and if he's drawing in the numbers that the UFC requires of him. But make no mistake that while this contract is certainly a good call in a lot of regards um, for Masvidal individually, he's probably leaving money on the table as well, right? We know he is based on the revenue. Uh, fighter revenue split. We we know he's leaving money on the table. So I can't imagine that he's going to renegotiate his contract again. He may try. Like, let's say he comes back, knocks out a couple people, wins the belt, becomes an even bigger phenomenon. He may try to renegotiate, but the UFC would need a certain bump in metrics to allow an, another renegotiation at this place. Otherwise, this is almost certainly the last contract Masvidal will ever sign for, at the, for the, with the UFC in terms of being a fighter, right? So, again, take it with a grain of salt that he might be top five paid fighter. Maybe he is, especially with the way that they are cutting 
veterans that are, are kind of middling and hiring brand new people through Dana White Contender Series and young up and coming guys that are getting paid 12K, 12K. He might be up there. I would not be shocked to see him top five. Top three, yeah, maybe. I mean, again, he's drawing very well. Uh, the only people I can think that of off the top of my head that are drawing more than him right now are McGregor and Adesanya, I would say. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, otherwise Masvidal sh- should be number three, I'd say, at this point. So yeah, it's easily he could be top three, but... Remember those caveats with the contract. It is important to remember it's not just, yep, he's now making as much as a champion. He's got it for a couple fights. He'll re-up for even more money, all that. No, this is probably a, all right, we'll give you this amount of money, but you are now, that's it. This is the last contract you're ever going to sign with us. And then that's probably what the scenario is. All right, next thing we've got to talk about today is the new signage you probably saw if you watched UFC 272. Um, So Sports Business Journal, broke this story shortly before 272 um, that they've created a new sponsor signage with fight deck, which is this new led decking system. Uh, You've seen it outside of the octagon. This past pay-per-view had some advertisements for Elden ring for Manscaped, things of that nature. Um, 10,000 pounds costing UFC an initial investment in the low seven figures for a system that offers 175 square feet of LED lighting display. So low seven figures, that's not, um, you know, <sighs> that's not cheap. But again, the amount of revenue they expect to get back out of this is pretty high. According to UFC Senior VP of Global Partnerships, Paul uh, Asensio, I believe I'm saying that right, this inventory will allow us at least an opportunity for a 15% boost in revenue. It was a huge factor in why Manscaped renewed with us. Uh, Demand for access to our live event inventory is at an all-time high. We need to get more creative and make new opportunities there. We're looking to attract more blue chip brands. and Having dynamic inventory like this should help. Uh, The UFC also, according to this article, has already surpassed last year's sponsorship revenues, which will make 2022 its third straight record year in that area. So, again... Big takeaways here. The initial low seven-figure investment already paid for itself if that's a driving factor as to why Manscaped renewed because we know Manscaped renewed for seven figures at least. Um, I think mid seven figures is last I heard. I'll have to double check on that. But, you know, they're pretty much already, it's already paying for itself. Uh, the fact that according to, you know, a, a Sino here, um, it's man, I'm sorry, I'm just butchering names. I'm the worst at names. Uh, um, you know, this will allow an opportunity for a 15% boost in revenue, and that demand for our access to our live event inventory is at an all time high. That right there is essentially saying we have a lot of sponsors who want to be part of live events that want to get their name on the canvas or on fighters' clothes or what have you. That's what sponsors are really asking for. That's what sponsorship deals or new sponsorship deals are going to get done. That's where is, is live event territory, not just on the website, not through commercials like Toyo tighter, Toyo, Toyo tires or anything like that. Live event showcases. 15% boost in revenue is huge. And again, already surpassed their previous sponsorship revenue. This is where the UFC is going to continue that growth. They can only cost a, Cost cut so much. You really can't. At some point, it becomes detrimental to cost cut. Got to pump up the actual revenue itself. Sponsorships are it. It is the the year, the age of sponsorships. And I would not be shocked if you don't see more sponsors ending up on fighter gear. Similar to crypto.com, I imagine you probably end up selling some space maybe on the trunks or on certain other areas, um, maybe in their walkout gear. Who knows that that'll have to be negotiated with um, Venom and and with other sponsors as well, depending on what those deals are. But still, yeah, this is only going to continue. And the fact that you can get a fifteen percent boost or potential fifteen percent boost in your revenue through an item that has essentially already paid for itself, if it was a key factor in Manscape 
renewing is, is also a no brainer, right? It, it makes absolute sense. W- can we see an led or expanded sponsorship on the fighter walkout? Wouldn't be shocked. Wouldn't be shocked if we, you know, it, think about just even a year or two ago, right? You, you had people all over the canvas like normal, but you didn't have anything on the actual kits. You didn't have the DraftKings clock. You didn't have nearly as many little vignettes during um, the broadcast itself. I mean, you still had Anik or whoever calling out sponsors, but you know now you're seeing more like brought to you by this. Right? We have battles, battle uh, motorsports or whatever it is who's sponsoring the light heavyweight division. It's it's just more reinforcement that I was right earlier when I spoke about the UFC going after sponsorships hard in the future. And that's their new revenue source. They're not looking to expand their markets. They're not looking, I mean, they are, but they're not pushing that nearly as hard as, as they did to get into China and Russia. They're not looking to, you know, break into a new geographical area. Now it's all about getting they want more blue chip brands. That means trying to get in bigger names who are going to pay more money and, and be a bigger part of this. It's part of their transformation since they've moved to a fixed revenue base and why they switched to uniforms in the first place. Remember, Lawrence Epstein talked about how ESPN wanted fighters to be, you know, have more uniforms, not have random sponsors all over themselves that looked hodgepodge with a banner. You had Condom Depot and all these weird sponsors that ESPN probably didn't want to be associated with. And I'm sure that Fox Sports, when they had the deal, didn't want to be associated with, right? It just isn't at all what they really want. They want control over who they're going to be associated with, and they want a cleaner looking product. The UFC made the changes to get to that cleaner looking product to get the broadcast rights deal. And now as they move forward, they will continue to add sponsors and look for more bigger blue chip brands, bigger names to get more money. Makes all the sense in the world. Really does. You're still going to have particular, you know, is it a brand fit sponsors like Monster Energy and, you know, Manscaped and those type of, you know, products, crypto, right? We just talked about that. But Ultimately, the end goal is to get to the bigger, higher names of this, right? Whether that is getting, um, you know, what, what's a big crypto coming like Binance, you know, or, or Coinbase. There you go. Coinbase, right? Coinbase would be a huge sponsorship for the UFC um, and would be kind of that blue chip brand in crypto areas. Although crypto.com is making some headway. Um, you, you've got Manscaped. Yeah, sure. That'd be great. But I mean, imagine Gillette or something like that, who still does some of those products, but maybe not highlighting that specific one, or maybe they do. And then they use the Gillette name brand. It's going to be a lot more money there. They are. It just, just is. DraftKings is kind of the premier brand of sports betting right now, given their rise. But it, it makes sense that they're they're adding more sponsorship areas and i would imagine you're going to continue to see this just more and more areas during the fights i'd guess fighter walkout next maybe the fighter walkout path is sponsored by a certain brand um i I mean or the weigh-ins right there there's there's plenty of opportunity to arrange some type of sponsorship with different parts of the the ufc um live events. And so I I can't imagine we don't see just a continuation of this, but yeah, big deal. I mean, 15% boost in revenue, huge for essentially paying for itself. All right. Next thing we're going to talk about here is not so much the Kayla Harrison resigning, but the PFL super fights, which was part of that announcement. So um, Kayla Harrison did resign with PFL for a multi-year deal. We've been talking about, you know, where she should go again. I think this, deal makes sense for her and it's not that shocking to me that this deal did happen once um we kind of heard the news from various sources that it was kind of leading this way so not shocked makes a lot of sense to me um sounds like again ufc offered her something but it wasn't anywhere in the near the ballpark of bellator and pfl bellator offered her quite the deal pfl matched it and so kayla kind of went with them 
But a key piece of that announcement, and in my opinion, the more interesting piece, is that uh, we are now looking at a, a pay-per-view super fight division. So PFL C CEO Peter Murray said in a statement that I am also excited to announce the PFL is launching a new pay-per-view super fight division where star MMA fighters will compete on a global stage against the best fighters in the sport. Two-time PFL champion Kayla Harrison will be fighting in the PFL's 2020 season starting this April on ESPN Networks and will also continue to build her legacy as a main event in the PFL's pay-per-view super fight division. So... When you unpack that, as well as you know some of the other quotes in here, and I'm looking at a article from the New York Post um, from Scott Fantana. Shout out to Scott, great dude. Um, you know, Harrison says, "I'm also excited. PFL is on board with helping me reach my goals of becoming the best and trying to acquire some of the biggest competition in the game to come and challenge me." There's only one person. If if you follow. You read into that, not so hard. Plus, if you follow Kayla Harrison on Twitter, there's only one person she's talking about. It's Chris Cyborg. And that's essentially what Peter Murray is also saying with Super super Fight Division, right? Is regardless of if Chris re-signs with Bellator or goes to PFL or what have you when her contract is up, it's clear that Harrison wants Cyborg. It's the only name outside of Amanda Nunes who, well, it would have been Amanda Nunes before she lost to Pena, although still Nunes would be a huge deal. It's the only name that really gives her a massive boost in credibility. And that's really what she's looking for. That's what Harrison is, is looking for at this point. And, and it's the PFL's kind of Achilles heel with Harrison, right? You have pushed her as the super dom dominant star. She goes out there, she crushes the competition. She is the face of your brand. But there is a, a big question surrounding how good she really is because of the competition she's faced. Because there really is no standard 155-pound division. Um, you know, that, that's something where Cyborg could easily make that weight, right? We know Cyborg could make 155, no problem. She'd be happy to. And if Harrison were to beat Cyborg, gives her instant credibility. Now, you've got Julia Budd, who is is moving into the division this year. That will help boost the credibility as well. But still, it's not, not that big name, right? Harrison needs either Nunez or Cyborg to take her to that next level and hopefully catapult her in to what she wants, which is superstardom. How likely is this to happen? Well, we know Bellator is is good for cross promotion. We've seen it in Rise in plenty, right? Um, now that also is a testament to Scott Coker's ties to uh, Rise and Sakabura and those things as well. But it's not out of the realm of possibility whatsoever that Bellator and PFL cross promote. I think if the deal was right, they'd be more than willing to have that cross promotional fight and, and kind of, you know, do a super fight. But part of the issue is, is that there is still a fair amount of risk for Bellator. If cyborg, their main women star right now goes over there and happens to lose to Harrison, it, it, it hurts them a little bit. And since they are at the stage of really homegrown, push of building new stu superstars guys like aj mckee um you know some of their some of their homegrown talent they they are all about challenging but they'd prefer the ufc to be honest because there's there's little risk right let's let's say aj mckee fights um volkanovsky if he, if aj mckee loses right then no harm, no foul. I mean, it, it doesn't help, but it also doesn't also doesn't hurt that much because there's a fair amount of people that already assume that Volkanovsky is better than AJ McKee. Mo I would say the majority of combat sports fans probably assume that because they're 
mostly the majority of combat sports fans are, are, or you MMA fans rather are UFC fans. So it wouldn't be great, but it also wouldn't really undercut the credibility that much. It would hurt, but not there. There's a limit to how much it would actually hurt. Whereas if AJ McKee went over to fight, um, uh, let's say it's not Lance Palmer who won last year. I forget who, who won last year in the, the 145 division, but let, let's say it's Lance Palmer, right? In, in PFL and then loses that gives PFL a big boost and it really undercuts Bellator's push that like, Hey, we have some of the best fighters in the world in the homegrown talent because it's not the two top guys fighting. Now it's, it's maybe number two and number three fighting and uh Oh, number three is beaten user. Now that gives a lot of cre- credibility to say Lance Palmer and then the PFL, but it really hurts Bellator and kind of knocks them down in a lot of fans eyes as you know, in the hierarchy of who's the best, because again, most fans it's UFC is the best. And then you've got Bellator and then you've got a kind of differing opinions about the rest. Right. And there are people that disagree with that order and, and depending on the division, all of that. Yes, sure. I'm, I hear you, but it would severely undercut Bellator's credibility if AJ McKee loses to somebody in PFL. To a UFC champion, not nearly as much. Much greater risk-reward ratio with UFC than with PFL. So that same still holds true, same facts still holds true with, with Cyborg, right? If Cyborg goes over there and loses to Harrison, that really helps PFL, and that kind of hurts Bellator. Because now, you know, the featherweight division, which has been a, a staple of Bellator for quite some time now, and they have a you know, actual featherweight division as compared to the UFC where it's a couple girls that move up to fight Nunes every so often. Um, That really hurts their credibility there, right? And yes, it's at 155, but that's fans won't care about that as much. They really don't. Hardcores do, but I, I mean, a loss is a loss, right? How many people started to discount Izzy because he lost to Jan Blauwicz? He's definitely out of the GOAT conversation, right? And yes, some people will argue and fight against that, but in the majority of of fans' eyes, that's the case. So, you know, despite that, you know, I'm sure Jan had a a ton of weight on Izzy, and that definitely played a factor in the wrestling game, right? I mean, we won't go down that path. I have my own opinions about that fight outside of the wrestling game anyway. But um, yeah, it, it makes a big difference. It really does. So will it happen? I could still see it if the money is right, but more likely PFL will try and sign Cyborg to a one or two fight deal after her Bellator contract expires, if Bellator can't secure her. Beyond that, Scott Coker, again, has shown willingness to do the super fights and and work with other promotions. There was always risk in, you know, him sending over, Darian Caldwell to Ryzen and then, you know, or Gucci one. That was a risk. I, I wouldn't be shocked if Coker, if the money is right and if the deal makes sense, Coker doesn't do that with Cyborg and Harrison. And that's really the only fight you can make for, for the super fight division for Harrison, other than Nunes, which the UFC will never do. So really all of that announcement is just to say, yeah, we're going to have a pay-per-view, hopefully with Kayla Harrison versus Chris Cyborg. That's really what they're saying here. As to other super fights, yes, you could get some Bellator or Ryzen guys in for super fights for pay-per-view, but are people going to really pay pay-per-view prices for that? Depends, right? What's the price point? Uh, Ryzen's pay-per-views are what? 10, 20 bucks? Something like that. I think 20. Um, not that bad. And And if PFL uses that type of price point, I think you're probably okay. If you get into the $40, $50 range, no way. I can't imagine this this super fight pay-per-view division has any legs to stand on. It, it just won't work. It, it's been proven kind of repeatedly through Bellator and through other entities in the past. If you try and go at a high price point and you don't have the perceived best fighters in the world fighting, you're not going to get the buys. 
right? There'd have to be some crazy gimmick. And like, if you, again, as a, do you do a super, f- super fight with uh, Jake Paul fighting somebody in, in MMA? Okay, sure. And yes, they've tried, they've tried to boost Clarissa Shields up, but it's apparent that Clarissa Shields would get destroyed by Kayla Harrison based on her last loss to anybody that can just wrestle. If it's a stand-up fight only, Clarissa Shields has a very good chance at winning that fight. Anyone that knows any sort of takedown, you know, uh, wrestling, jujitsu, anybody that has skill in that area, probably going to submit Shields once we get into that elite tier. I have no doubt if you did Harrison versus Clarissa Shields, Harrison would steamroll her unless Harrison got clipped on the way in or wanted to keep it standing to prove a point. Either way. I mean, Harrison just should be able to roll through Clarissa Shields, right? Um, so, yeah, you could end up doing like a weird super fight with Clarissa Shields and, and a, a, you know, another boxer or something, or you do, um, you know, you do something along the lines of a, a Ryzen champion versus PFL champion or superstar, uh, you know, or Bellator. You could, you could, Add PFL into the mix of Bellator Rising crossover and just kind of do whatever. But the pay per view point has to be low. That's the only way you're you're going to get people to buy this. Twenty bucks, okay. I might watch. I might pay twenty bucks to watch Harrison versus Cyborg. Fifty? No, that's far too high. And I'm sure they're doing some numbers, or at least I hope they're they're running some numbers in the background to find that right p- price point. But price point will be key here. I'm more than happy to pay for a Ryzen pay-per-view. It's a whole show. I love Ryzen. It's all good. And it's only 20 bucks. That's not that bad. But if you were to ask me to pay 50 bucks for a Ryzen pay-per-view, and sorry for all the noise. I don't know what's going on outside. Um, that, that, then it gets a little bit dicey for me. And I'm not sure that this pay-per-view division is going to be what PFL thinks it is, right? They have trouble just drawing regular ratings on ESPN. This isn't, going to be some flip, you know, switches flip because Cyborg is fighting Harrison. You'll get more eyes on it, yes, but you're going to get people to pay 50 bucks? I don't know. Let me know in the comments if you would pay $50 to see Harrison versus Cyborg. That's what I'm curious about. And you know, the interesting thing is, I know a fair amount of you hardcores gladly will, but if this was on... UFC, if this was a UFC pay-per-view headliner, right? How would this do? That's another question. Because, yeah, maybe maybe it is worth charging $50 and maybe you get 100, 200K. But I don't know. To me, I think the price point has to be lower because you've got a much base. I don't know. That's just me personally. But let, let me know how much would you pay on pay-per-view to watch Kayla Harrison versus Chris Cyborg, because that's what this is all about. So let me know in the comments um, or hit me up on Twitter. Let me know your thoughts on this. I'm very curious. I say $20. I'll pay $20 for that fight, sure. 50, no way. 30, uh, maybe, depends on what else is on the card. But then you're getting there. 40, I don't think so. 30 is kind of near my breaking point. If you stack the card the rest of the way, maybe. But I don't know. All right, last thing we're going to talk about today is Endeavor is facing a lawsuit for allegedly stealing ideas for their IPO. So um, this guy, his name is, let me pull it up, David Card, uh, filed a complaint against Endeavor that essentially says, we, I, I gave materials and gave a blueprint of how to communicate the IPO to investors to have it be successful because the 2019 IPO was unsuccessful, which was partially on Endeavor. It was also just the, the current climate. That was around WeWork, um, Peloton, all that stuff. Um, Endeavor has denied the allegations, right? Uh, in a statement, they said, we believe these claims without merit and Endeavor intends to defend itself vigorously. Um, according to the complaint, simply put, no one thought Endeavor had structure to their company. No one thought Endeavor made any sense as an enterprise. Um And then it essentially says that based on this analysis and blueprint that uh, 
Mr. Card gave, it essentially gave in Endeavor the correct way and the materials needed to effectively sell the IPO. Whether there's truth to this or not, it's hard to say. That'll come out in court itself, right? But the basis of the claim is an important one and one I've talked about on the show a couple of times, but this, this is a real life in the wild scenario that kind of highlights it. And that is, again, it's all about selling. When you're a startup, when you're a particular company doing whatever, it's all about how you communicate and how you sell. The world is still very much run by salesmen. It's important to remember that. And Yes, Endeavor has been around for a while. Um, this isn't some brand new company right off the block, but you you kind of go through that same fundraising startup mode when you launch an IPO. You, you go through it all over again. When you're first starting a company and hanging the streets and selling your idea and trying to get investors on board, doing Series A funding and pre-seed funding and all this stuff, you are... Pitching this idea that has little to no teeth, very little metrics, and you are just saying like, look, this will work. Trust me. IPO, you have a lot more data that you can highlight and show, uh, a lot more cracks in the armor, right? After this, you know, your idea has been actually tested and implemented for quite some time, it highlights deficiencies, things you need to work on. But ultimately, again, it comes down to how you spin it. It comes down to how you sell it and how you pitch the vision and the idea. This lawsuit is essentially saying that Endeavor is a hodgepodge of businesses, right? A hodgepodge of unrelated businesses um, that has a ton of debt and lost a bunch of money in 2019, which is all true. And it wasn't until the, Mr. David Card came and said, like, look, here's how you sell it that it ever took those materials and then sold it. And that wall street kind of bit and said, okay, we're about this. We can sell this. The right pitch is everything. Startup IPO, whatever. I mean, that's the basis of this complaint. If it's true that again, he laid out this particular set of materials and blueprint on how to communicate this and then endeavor copy that, that is a valid claim. Because that's really how you get the support you need to launch an IPO. Just like it's how you get the support you need to get pre-seed funding to start a company. So, again, this is a scenario where it, it just highlights, I, I cannot drive this home enough. Companies are all founded and started on Yes, great ideas, at least the successful ones, but also the right salesman, the right pitch. This is an example of that. You have to have the right pitch. Endeavor had a ton of debt, had lost a bunch of money in 2019, $554 million in losses, $4.5 billion in debt at the time right? In 2019, when they first tried to do their IPO and it, it fizzled, there wasn't enough appetite. They first revised their price and then they pulled the IPO last minute. It, and that's never a good thing to do if you're a company that hurts you. And then they came back and they bought out the rest of the UFC. They had the right pitch and now Endeavor's stock, I think is still up compared to where it was on the IPO price. It, I'm almost positive it is. That's very important. And they launched at a much higher price than what they would have had to in 2019. Cannot highlight this enough because this kind of goes over the heads of a lot of people. A lot of people think that a, a great business is you have a, a groundbreaking idea and you get the pieces in place. And as you produce the idea or the product or service or what have you, you know, naturally you start coming into all this money and then you grow and build. No. Maybe back in the day, that's what it used to be. But nowadays, it's literally, how do I get that first round of funding? How do I get that Series A? How do I get these investors to give me money to even try this? And you have a ton of investment ideas and a ton of things that fall completely flat. WeWork, best example of that, was valued way, way, way too high and then just came crashing down. 
right? And yes, the pandemic hurt and all that, but prior to the pandemic, that was 2019 when it was valued several, you know, multiple tens of billions of dollars higher than it actually ended up, you know, being valued for once SoftBank came in and saved them and did all that stuff. And Adam uh, Newman or whatever got removed. It's important to understand that piece because that's how things work now. So again, valid complaint here. If it's true, Endeavor just kind of ran off with those blueprints and it highlights, highlights again, just like with the startup, how an IPO works. You, you've got to sell. You've got to get people on board. Whether the idea is garbage or not, it's all about how you pitch it. Because you can get very smart, very deep-pocketed investors to pay you a ton of money for an awful idea if you can sell it right. And vice versa. You can have the best idea in the world. If you can't pitch it correctly, you're not going to get any money to get it off the ground. So important to highlight in the wild an example of where Pitch is important enough that they're getting sued. All right, guys. Well, that wraps up this episode of the Fight Business Podcast. Appreciate you guys for listening. Again, if you're listening through Anchor, Apple, Spotify, what have you, check SureDog, the, the SureDog official list. That's where it's coming out now. Again, I will try and backfill some of those episodes through Anchor, but that's the new new place to be listening to the podcast at. Um Otherwise, if you're on YouTube, make sure you hit the like, subscribe, bell notification, drop some comments. Let me know how you feel about Eagle FC. Again, what's your pay-per-view price for uh, Cyborg versus Harrison? Where does that rank for you? Um, you know, any, any other questions, anything else? Masvidal's new contract, do you really think he's getting paid that well? Do you really believe it? Should he be? Let me know all your thoughts on that. Uh, but love you guys as always. Uh, know this is going to be released a little bit later in the week. It's on me, but I will, you know, pump it out there as always and appreciate y'all. And until next time, get money.